Okay, welcome to the October 21 edition of the Manhattan GMAT Study Hall. On the screen you have the menu of topics for today. In quantitative, we're going to talk about data sufficiency problems that have if in the statement. And in sentence correction, we're going to talk about sentences that make numerical comparisons. So more than, less than, as much as, twice, double. Um, a number of you have been submitting questions about that sort of thing, so that's today's sentence correction topic. Um, the usual, we got to give you, just like when you get on a plane for the first couple of minutes, they have to give you the safety talk on every flight. We have to give you the talk about what to submit. So here's the usual warnings. Let's go ahead and run through this real quickly. Problem submissions, people are still submitting problems every week that violate these guidelines, so be sure to pay attention to them. Um, this is the big red flag here that people are, do people are doing this all the time still. Do not submit problems that are too general. So some people are asking questions like, how do I solve problems faster? Or how do I do geometry problems? Um, th this is not stuff that you could address really in one study hall. Th these are topics that are too broad. Um, some people are even asking things like, how do I do verbal better? Which is way too broad of a topic. I mean, that would be hundreds of hours if, if we were going to do all of that. So it's got to be something that could reasonably be covered in, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, half an hour, something like that. Also, don't, on the other side of this, don't submit problems that are too specific. In other words, don't give me one problem with two answer choices and ask me what the difference is. That is why we have the forums. Um, the forums, if you don't have the address, here's the address of the forums. Type it on the board. It's www.manhattangmat.com slash forums. So if you have really specific questions, um, okay, people are doing interesting things with the Illuminate. Um, remember, this is pretty much a, a text and talk only sort of application. So um, please don't do things like mess around with microphones and, and request access to desktops and things like that. Thanks. Um, okay. Back to what we're talking about. The forums are for specific questions. Like if you have one problem with two answer choices that you're asking about, you should just post that on the forum because the same materials that are allowed here are allowed in the forums too. Also, some people this week submitted personal issues. Please don't do that. Um, in other words, please don't ask about your own study plan or anything like that. That's, the forums are for this, too. So if you have, here's my score, here's my goal score, what's my study plan, we have the general questions folder on the forum for that purpose. So please post your question in the general questions folder. Um, Remember, these study halls are watched by hundreds of people, so we, we're not going to use an individual person's study plan as an example. Um, if it's an admissions question, there's a folder for that. So what should you submit? You should submit topics of intermediate depth. For example, one of the problems that we did last week, one of the topics, was statistics questions involving the median. This is a nice, pretty narrow, circumscribed topic. It's not overly specific to the point of being ridiculous. And um, it's a good topic. It's good enough for a half hour, 45 minute discussion. So that's what we want. Um, if you post something specific, you need to generalize the question in some sort of way. Please do not just, um, please do not just ask a specific problem. That's what the forums are for. Tie into a more general idea. So if you do present one problem about two choices, then at least generalize. Ask about the type of structure or ask about the modifier or something like that. 
Also, most importantly, every week people are submitting OG problems. So please do not submit OG problems. We are not allowed to use them because of copyright rules. So if you submit those, we will just have to ignore them. Um, for the person in the text box whose audio is not working, um, I'll type a response to you in the text box right now. Okay. Um, if any of you here get cut off or anything like that or have tech problems, just make sure you know the recordings will be posted online in four to five days. So you will be able to see that. Um, also, if you submit problems, you have to tell us where the problems come from, including our own. We don't memorize all of our own problems, so please tell us the source of everything, even if we are the source. Also, forums are not a source. Make sure you know this. Forums are secondhand. We need the first-hand source of the problem. So if you say a problem is from GMAT Club, for instance, that's not good enough because GMAT Club doesn't write problems. Like you have to tell us where who wrote the problem. Just so we know we're not treading on any copyright toes here. Um, in the forums, there are complete lists of sources that you are and are not allowed to post from. Um, to the person inquiring in the text box, the sessions have all been posted online except for the very, very, very first one, which was we didn't know it was going to be an ongoing series at that point, but every other session of this study hall is online. Okay, um, smiley face, if you guys understand the, uh, the, the session agreement here, the questions that you need to submit and so on. Um, again, it's important. We have to give you the warnings, but also if you're going to submit questions, make sure you follow the rules because if you don't, then you're basically just wasting time because we have to, we, we cannot risk copyright violation by using questions that don't satisfy these criteria. Okay, let's do it. Um, let's jump into the quant. So we're going to start by talking about data sufficiencies that have if statements in them. What I'll do is I'm going to start by just throwing a problem at you and seeing how that goes. So you should just you should see some question and answer choices appear in your screen over there. So important note, there should be buttons over here on the left hand side of your screen. Um, you should see A, B, C, D, E. Buttons to the left when we do practice problems use these buttons do not enter your answer into the text box okay so just to make sure we are all on the same page with that please it choose answer choice a if you understand it I mean, every session we have a few people who are typing answers into the text box, and we don't want that. So pick choice A, not the smiley face. Pick choice A in those buttons if you understand what we're talking about. There are a lot of people who are not picking it. Okay, again, you should see five answer choices over here. We're not looking for smiley faces right now. I want to make sure you guys know where the multiple choice answers are located. So there should be an A, B, C, D, E. A couple of you, GMAT Ninja, Chaitanya, GMAT Taker, Gen 1, Catherine, you guys are not clicking it. So I'll give you about five or ten more seconds to find it. Then we'll do a problem. Okay, here's the first problem. I'm going to throw it at you, clear out your answers. I'll give you a time of about two minutes for this, go for it. OK, 
Okay, that's two minutes, so please, in the next 10 or 15 seconds, pick an answer. Thank you. There's, uh, we're waiting on Chaitanya, Jen, and Catherine. Remember, the GMAT is a test where you can't leave stuff blank. So, again, please do not answer your question in the text box. Please indicate using the buttons. Okay. Um, three more seconds. I'll give you here are your statistics. Okay. The class did a pretty good job here. But the point of today is to know how to handle things that are in weird places like this. In other words, what do you do with that statement? That's the point. That's the crux of today's lesson. So let's talk about that. Does anybody know when, type in the text box if you know, when is this statement true? Vague sounding question, but give it to me in the text box if you understand. When is that true? I mean, in the context of the problem. So, I mean, some of you guys are saying things that are sort of true from a logic standpoint, but are, are we supposed to prove this, or is this part of the question, or is this part of the statement? This is a statement. Let me give you a simple example. Maybe you can follow it. Now, now you guys are starting to get there. It's a given. Um, if some problems look like this. If you, like, they'll start with, like, if n is a positive integer then is n odd. And then they'll give you two statements. Like, you know, I don't care what the statements are right now. Um, the question is, in this problem, when is n a positive integer? And you guys are starting to say it in the text box and see if anybody else has anything to add. When is n a positive integer in this problem. So we'll get back to that problem in a second up there. But in this problem, it's always it's assumed. So whatever follows, this is an assumption. That's how these data sufficiency questions work. If you have words following the word if, like that right there, this is an assumption. So that's a really, really big, big takeaway here, which is this. It's a huge lesson that you guys should know. And a lot of people, judging from this kind of stuff that was written in the text box, a lot of people are a little bit hazy on this. Huge lesson for you to know here. Anything following if in a data sufficiency problem is always assumed to be true. So in other words, in this whole problem, you assume that n is a positive integer. Anything following if is assumed to be true. So we'll come back to this problem in a second. But let's show you how to rearrange this. So let's do a general template for this sort of thing. Because you're going to want to rearrange the question. So if you see a data sufficiency question that looks like this, If some statement, I'm going to use color coding for this because color coding is cool. If some statement written in red, then let's say you have a question written in green.
And let's say statement one is something in blue, and statement two is something in, in I don't know, orange maybe. So that will be statement one. That will be statement two. The way that you, you should rearrange this is you should rearrange it with the knowledge that the red thing is always true. And so the question part is really just the green question. You should rearrange the data sufficiency problem so it's just the question. And then because the red statement is assumed to be true, you can just add it to the statements that are already there. So statement one is still that. Statement two is still that. But then whatever it says after the if part, you can add it. You can just add whatever is in there. So statement one actually becomes two things. Statement two also becomes two things. So, and I mean, this is a massive rearrangement that's really going to help you in a lot of these problems. It's going to make a lot of these problems much simpler. So if you see this sort of question, then you should rearrange it so that it looks like this. All right, if this makes sense to you, give me a smiley face icon over there in the left panel. And you should do this every single time you are confused by one of these if questions. And you're going to see this is going to make a huge, huge, massive difference because with problems like the one in this panel, the big problem is that people just don't understand the question. So let's take this over to the next page. And we'll use the same color code. So this will be the red part. And then this is the blue statement. And this is the orange statement. And this is the green question. So if you see this kind of thing, you should rearrange it on your paper as type in the text box how much of this is really the question. In the text box, what is the question in this case? Just the green part. Yeah, the question is just is x minus y greater than x plus y. So so we'll, we'll deal with that statement in a second. Now, what is statement one really in the text box? What actually is statement one? Statement one is not just x equals 8. It's actually x equals 8 and what else? Please tell me in the text box. Yeah, so it's, well, it's the, the x, the blue, and the red part. So it's x minus y. It's x equals 8 and x minus y is greater than 10. So there. And then statement two, you got to do the same sort of thing. So statement two is y equals negative 20. And then adding in the red part, and x minus y is greater than 10. So this is probably going to make your lives a lot easier. Let's go ahead and go through this problem just to see how it works. Um, a couple of you people have been rearranging the question, so let's do that real quick. You can play with this question a little bit. Is x minus y greater than x plus y? You can take x away from both sides of this question. And so you wind up with is negative y greater than y. You can add y to both sides of that. So you get is 0 greater than 2y. So that's the same as asking is y negative. 
So the real question we're trying to answer is, is Y negative? Give me a smiley face if you understand this question, that this is actually the question being asked here. Give me the other face if you don't get that. Smiley face if you do. Okay, so we've got one non-smiley face. Um, I'll give a quick explanation for the non-smiley face. When you have a question, you can always do algebra on the question. You can do you can do whatever steps are legitimate to simplify what's going on in the question. So if you see an inequality like this where you've got the same letters on both sides of the inequality, before you start addressing it, you should definitely play around with it algebraically first and see if you can get it to simplify. So in this case, the X is on both sides, so you can basically just take it away. And then you wind up with a simpler inequality. Um, if you need more help than that, you can always shoot a quick email. All right, so the real question to answer here is whether Y is negative or not. So statement one, you've got X equals 8 and X minus Y is 10, greater than 10. So this means you can just take X and you can substitute it into 8. So this value of X is 8. So 8 minus Y is 10, greater than 10. So that means you can take 8 away and you get negative Y is greater than 2. You can divide this by negative 1 and you wind up with y, alligator flips around, so you have y is less than negative 2. So this is sufficient, because if y is less than negative 2, then y is definitely negative. Um, statement 2, you're already told that y is a negative number, so you actually don't have to do any work. So... Yes, you have to flip when you divide by a negative. If you need more information on that, you can look in our Foundations of Math book where we go over all that kind of stuff. Um, someone's asking what if y is less than negative 1. That, that would still be negative. I mean, numbers less than a negative are, are still negative, no matter what negative that is. Okay, so these are both sufficient. You wind up with an overall answer of the like dog. Any questions about this problem, go ahead and type them in the text box, please. Um, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, please do not use the hand raise button. If you have a question, just type it in the text box. Um, okay, so smiley faces if you guys understand what's going on here, especially the rearrangement of the question. This is the important part here. I mean, about 40% of the class got this right. And that's 40% of the people who voted, so that's really less than 40%. But let's try another one of similar difficulty level, then we'll try a harder one um, and see how this goes. Actually, this one's a little bit more challenging than that last one. Give it a shot. So I've cleared out your A through E answers. Again, um, just to reiterate, please do not type answers into the text box. So please answer in using the A through E buttons. Um, numerical difficulty level is not something that really matters, but the last problem would not be considered like that hard. It wouldn't be super easy, but it, it, it's not that hard either. It's, you know, somewhere in the mid-range. Okay, I'll give you a clock for this one. I'll give you like two minutes. There you go. Two minutes. Have a good one. Okay, that is two minutes. I'll give you guys about 15 more seconds to answer the question. Please answer using A through E indicators. Okay, we're waiting for, um, remember, if you have to guess, you should guess. This is a test where you do not have the option of leaving things blank. So 
we are waiting on an MD, Ali, and Angela. So go ahead and pick answers, please. Okay, so here are your statistics. Um, split decision on A versus B here. Again, it's one of these questions with the if in front of the question, with an if in front of the statement. So let's go ahead and take a look. Um, I'm going to run through the rearrangement a little bit more quickly this time, but again, this is the theme. The theme is the rearrangement of the question. You should rearrange the question so that you take the red statement out of the if and put it into the statement. So the green question here is x negative. That's the only thing here that's really a question. Then statement one tells you that y is positive, but you also know that negative 2x is greater than 3y. Statement two, you know that 2x plus 5y minus 20 is 0. And you can take the red thing again and put it into the statement. Okay. So, and the question you're trying to address is the sign of x. You want to know whether x is negative. So, statement 1, probably easier to think about signs than to think about any sort of arithmetic. But I'll give you two approaches to statement 1. One way to think about it is a number properties approach. If you want to use a number properties approach, you can realize that y is a positive number. So that means that 3y three, three is also a positive number. Because 3 times a positive. Therefore, you have negative 2x greater than 3y. That means that negative 2x is greater than something that is positive. If you're bigger than a positive number, then you are also positive. So this means negative 2x is also positive, even greater. So therefore, x is negative. Because 2x is negative, so therefore x is negative. That's sufficient. Okay, let me give you another approach. Smiley face if you guys understand this one. There's a takeaway here, which is the lesson that you want to get out of this one is that sometimes inequalities involving zero are not really inequalities. So take away from this one is if you see an inequality involving zero, you may want to think about positive, negative, and zero rather than just doing algebra. Another approach to this statement, let's do another approach. If you didn't want to do the number properties approach, let's say you felt like doing algebra, you can do that too. Statement one, algebra approach. So y is 0, negative 2x is 3y, x is greater than 3y. The rule is if you have two inequalities, then you can add them if they have the same inequality sign, the same alligator, so to speak. So you can add these together, but the deal is that we want to try to make these equal so that they can cancel out this y and this 3y. Because then we can add those together and get the y to go away. So we can multiply times 3 here. If we do that, we get 3y is greater than 0. And we also have that negative 2x is greater than 3y. So we can add these. And if we add these, 
we get negative 2x plus 3y is greater than 3y, which means that negative 2x is greater than 0. So if you divide by negative 2, remember whoever asked last time if you divide by a negative, that means that you have to flip that alligator around. So x is less than 0. All right, smiley face if this makes sense. Again, the other phase, if it doesn't, um, this, the goal of multiplying by 3 here is to get those y's to cancel out. Like, if you put the same a quantity on both sides, then you're going to get it to go away. Second statement, let's take that over there. So let's just import this whole thing over to here. Does anybody know how to handle a simultaneous equation and inequality? Because again, we'll do two ways. Anybody got any ideas in the text box? Okay, you can substitute. That's one way. We'll talk about how to do that. Okay, everybody's saying substitute. So it turns out you can do that. All right, let's take a substitution approach. You can't substitute really an inequality into an equation. You, know, you can't really substitute an inequality into an equation. So what you have to do is you have to get your substitution from the equation. And then you're going to put that into the inequality. That's important because substitutions generally come from equations, not inequalities. You can't really substitute less than into something. Or at least if you, if you try, it's kind of awkward. So you've got two... The question is... Here's a question. Should we solve for x or should we solve for y? Go ahead and tell me in the text box. Most of you are saying X. Okay, now it's about half and half. More of you are saying X than Y. You should solve for Y, not X. Big, big lesson here. Um, when you substitute, you should solve for the variable that you do not want. So we don't want x, so we should solve for x. I think I said y before. We should solve for x because x is going to go away. So because remember, when you substitute, what you're doing is you're getting an expression that you're going to plug in for and make that variable go away. So we want, sorry, we, I, okay, I'm, I'm confused. We do not want y because the question is about x. So rewind, sorry, um, the last 30 seconds didn't happen. Okay, we, the question is about x, so we don't want y, sorry for the confusion. Dyslexia doesn't help. <laughs> so we don't want y, so solve for y. So you get... 5y, move the stuff to the other side of the equation, so 5y is 20 minus 2x. So y is divided by 5, you get 0.4 minus, you get 4 minus 0.4x. Then you can substitute. So you get negative 2x is greater than 3 times that. Four minus point four x. That gives you that negative two x is greater than twelve minus one point two x. You can move that one point two to the other side. 
So that's greater than 12 is positive. You don't really need to keep solving. So um, negative, negative 0.8x is positive. So x is negative. So they're both sufficient again. This one is D. So the people who pick D are correct. Um, there's one other way that you can approach this. Let me show it to you real quick. Um, if you don't want to do a substitution approach or if the substitution approach confuses you, then you can always actually, these are tailor made to just be added together. You can add an inequality, you can add an inequality to an equation. So you've got 2x plus 5y minus 20 equals 0. And you also have negative 2x is greater than 3y. These can be added. You can't add together opposite inequalities, but you can add together two inequalities that are the same, and you can add together an equals and an inequality. So if you do that, the 2x is cancel, and you wind up with 5y minus 20 equals 0. And so y is 4, greater than 0. y is greater than 4. So 5y is greater than 20, y is greater than 4. But we don't want y, so we got to plug back in. We, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, 0 plus 3. Well, let, let, let's wipe that. Let's do something else with it because that, that's going to wind up being more solving than we want. I did make a mistake there. Pardon me for that. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, let's do something else. What's the variable we want to get rid of? Text box. We want to get rid of which variable? We want to get rid of y. So if we make x's cancel, that's actually not achieving that goal. So how can we get rid of this y? Does anybody have any ideas? Yeah, you can multiply. A couple of you are saying in the text box, so in case you don't have the text box, you can multiply this top equation by 3. And you can multiply the bottom equation by 5. You can't multiply by an LCM because it's not one equation. It's two different equations. So if you multiply them both by 15, you're actually not going to accomplish anything. So if you multiply the first one by 3, you get 6x plus 15y minus 60. And the second one times 5 gives you negative 10x is greater than 15y. So these can be added together. If you add these together, you get 6x plus 15y minus 10x minus 60 is greater than 15y. So the 15y's go away. You can subtract those out. And if you do, you wind up with negative 4x minus 60 is greater than 0. So that means that negative 4x is greater than 60. And if you divide by negative 4, you wind up with x is less than negative 15. So that's sufficient because that's definitely a negative number. So either way you do this, sorry for the mistake earlier, if that confused anybody, I hope we're all on the same page. Um, if you get this, give me the smiley face. If you have any questions, go ahead and type those in the text box, please. Um, yes, you can add inequalities to equations. Um, let me just make a quick note about that if people are confused. Um, what can we add and what can we not add? So to add or not to add. The best way to do it is to, the best way to figure this out, if you don't have these memorized, just think about money examples. Let me show you what I mean. All right, let's say, yeah, you want to solve for the variable that you don't want. That's what we had here. 
because it goes away. The variable that you solve for gets gone. I mean, if, if you can only figure out how to solve for the other variable, then do it. It's better than sitting there. But, I did, but then you have to plug back in to find the one you want, which is kind of ugly. Okay, when you add equations, you're not solving for anything. You're just adding the equation. So that's it's a non-issue when you add equations. I and mean, you can strategize in order to cancel stuff, but it's not the same as doing a substitution. It's not as direct. So if you have x is greater than 30, y is greater than 20, these you can add. So, yeah, you just focus on canceling. Good. I mean, the, the way, what I mean by money examples, it's easier to remember this if you think about it as dollars. Like, if I have more than $20 and my brother has more than $30, then we definitely have more than 50. All right, so also if you have them facing opposite ways, you can do that too, right? They both, they both face the opposite way. So if you have this, it's the same way as each other, still good. So here you still get x plus y is less than 50. That works. But on the other hand, if you have x greater than 30 and y less than 20, you can't add this. So the money example to think about here is I have more than $30 and my brother has less than $20. Here you don't know. Like if I have a thousand dollars and he has nothing, then that's more than fifty. If I have thirty one and he has nothing, that's less than fifty. So these work, you can add two of the same inequality. Let's see what else you can do. What else you can do is also you can um, if one of them is an uh, let me edit this real quick. If one of them is a greater than or equal to, then who knows what you get out of that? Text box if you know. Again, think about money examples. Most of you are actually answering this incorrectly. Um, if you add these together, then the character that you get is actually one of these. It's a strict greater than. Because again, think about, think about money. Um, if, if I have at least 30 bucks, or, you know, an item in a store costs $30, and then another item costs more than 20 bucks, then you're going to spend over 50 bucks. So you're not, you can't spend 50 because they would have to be 30 and 20. So, And, but but then if they are both greater than or equal to, then then it's going to work out. So if you have x is greater than or equal to 30 and y is greater than or equal to 20, then so that symbols will appear in a second. Then in that case, you're really going to get one of these. So you're going to get x plus y, and you're going to get a 50. So the lessons here about adding inequalities. Oh, and then finally, the um, if you have x is greater than 30 and y is equal to 20, then that's going to give you x plus y is greater than 50. Again, it's easier to think about this in terms of money again. 
if you have more than $30 plus a $20 surcharge, then that's more than $50. It should all make easy sense if you just think about it in a real life context. So let's sum up here before we move on to another problem. Um, the summary here is if you have the same inequality direction, i.e. all of them are less than or all of them are greater than, then you can add. Okay. If you add mixed less thans and less than or equal to's, If you've got, then you get a, then out of that you get a strict less than. Same thing is true for greater than. And then you can also add an equation to an inequality. You'll get the same thing as the inequality. And then finally, if you add all greater than, less than or equal to's, then you get another less than or equal to. So if you add a bunch of those, you get another one. Okay, smiley face if you guys understand the stuff that is on the screen. Okay, it looks pretty good. Um, let's see. Um, someone's asking a question about the inequality on the preceding page. Um, whoever, GMAT Taker asking a question about the previous problem, why don't you just email me that question? Um, that'd be the easiest way to do that because we're we're done with that question as an audience. So just shoot me an email about it. And I'll take a look. Okay. Um, all right. So let's take a look at one more of these. Then we'll move on to sentence correction. Let's do... Actually, let's, let's move on to sentence correction. I think we get the point. Okay, so let's do the next topic, which is this, numerical comparison questions. So these are the questions that deal with like as much as, twice as much as, half as much as, stuff like that. So, and then on this page, we're going to go ahead and summarize. We're going to keep returning to this page to put some summary points out there. Post summary points. All right. So, but for now, I'll just throw you guys into the fire, so to speak, and give you a problem to solve. So here's the problem. I'll give you about a minute 20. Again, please indicate your answers with the A through E buttons. Thank you very much. Please indicate. Using A through E buttons, not text box. Go for it. Here's a clock. Have a good time. Please do not play around with the whiteboard. Thank you. Time is called. Please indicate an answer in the next 10 seconds. Thank you. Okay, yeah, here are your statistics as a class. This one's pretty good, actually. Um, 
So quite good. We can probably run through the treatment of this one pretty quickly. Does anybody have an explanation in the text box for anything? Go ahead and type some things in the text box that you use to solve this, and then we'll discuss. Okay, it's comparison. So while you guys are typing in, we'll start discussing. Go ahead and keep typing, please. Um, okay, so yeah, the first thing is to notice that this sentence makes a comparison. All the ones we're going to look at today make comparisons, but you got to know when you are making a comparison in these in these sentences. So whenever you talk about any sort of faster, slower, as much as, anything like that, twice as much, double, half, equal to, less than, greater than, faster than, higher than, shorter than, any, those are all what we call numerical comparisons. I mean, all numerical comparisons fall into this category. So I'm going to list, list some of those here again. Numerical comparisons such as faster than, slower than, higher, lower, as much as, equal to, twice, half, as much as, etc. fall into this group. So what do we know about comparison? I mean, you guys have typed some good stuff into the text box. What's the main thing that has to be true in general about comparisons? What has to be true about them? They must be parallel. Exactly. And parallelism doesn't just mean grammar. More importantly, in these cases, it means context, too. So comparisons must be parallel. Right, this means you've got to have parallel grammar, that's true, but it also means that you've got to have parallel contexts, which means you must actually compare things that are comparable in the first place. So let's put that on the takeaways page over here. First thing we learned is comparisons are parallel. You got to have parallel grammar, but you also got to have parallel context. So this is this is what's more important. There are a lot more issues with this one. So let's talk about that in this case. Parallel contexts. So this is a problem because you've got Japan's population versus any other nation. Okay, if you can't see the highlight, if you just see the bold face, then we'll put it in bold face and underline for you. Any other nation, but then this one says the population of Japan. It doesn't just say Japan. So that's not an okay comparison. You can't compare a population to a country, so that makes B incorrect. Smiley faces, that makes sense. Okay, also, D has the same problem. D is comparing the Japanese population. Oops, wrong kind of mark. D is comparing the Japanese population to any other country. Japanese population, any other nation. It's cute, it rhymes, but it's incorrect. Because you can't compare a population to a country. So, same issue there. That's the main goal I want to get across today, is that when you look at these sorts of, in this problem, is that when you look at these sorts of things, you've got to have comparisons that make sense. So on the other hand, green light on these ones, Japan's population and that of any other nation. 
that of is a pronoun. It's got to have something to stand for over here. But it does. That is the population. So that works. Same thing here. You've got any other nations, Japan's population. You, you can do this sort of elision thing if you have Japan's population and any other nations. That much is okay because it's understood to be population. Understood to be the same as what's in the other part. So understood to be the same. So that much, this is not the correct answer, but this is not a mistake. And it's okay to say that it's Japan's population by just saying any other nation's apostrophe. And finally, in choice C, we've got the population of Japan and we've got that of any other nation. So just as in the choice E, we've got a population and a that, that stands for population. Okay, any questions about this so far? Three comparisons in green are okay, the two comparisons in yellow are not okay. Smiley face, if that makes sense. Smiley face. Okay. A few smileys, about half the class, maybe two thirds of the class. Um, if you have questions, type them in the text box. I'll tell you what's wrong with A and E. Um, what's wrong with A, I'll just type it down in the bottom part. There's the modifier, the opening modifier shrinking faster than any other nations must modify the following subject. In general, when you start modifiers with ing like this, it's got to modify the following subject. So that's incorrect because it doesn't. If you ask yourself what is shrinking, it's not the decline. So this is a modifier error. This sentence implies that the decline, projected decline, is shrinking. That's not true. It's supposed to be the population. So again, just to review, when you have an ING modifier that starts the sentence like this in front of a comma, then it's talking about whatever subject is here, whether you like it or not. So, smiley face, if that makes sense, that's what makes A incorrect. So, again, this modifier mistakenly modifies this. And that's not what we want. So, not smiley face there. So A is wrong. And then the problem with E is just a bad idiom. Um, you don't have a projected decline at 17%. This is just not idiomatically correct way to represent percentage changes. Bad idiom. Okay. Um, any questions about this problem? The main point of this problem today is that you'd better be comparing a nation to a nation or a population to a population. You have to be consistent with your comparison. Questions, type them in the text box. Smiley face if you get it. We'll move on to another one. Um, someone in the text box is saying, can we talk about comma ing? Not today. That's not today's topic. Um, if you want to submit that as a topic, then please submit that the same place you submit all the other topics on the, on the class web page. Um, correct answer here, well, we crossed out A, B, and D, and E, so the correct answer is the one that's left. All right, let's move on. Let's try this one. 
right here. I'm going to give you, this one's nice and short, so I'll give you about 50 seconds. Go for it. I'll give you about another 10 seconds to give me an answer to the problem. So please go ahead. Give me some sort of answer if you could. Okay, um, people are still sort of changing their minds here, but let's go ahead and discuss. Um, here's your statistics. So people were kind of guessing. Let's take a look. All right. First of all, let's figure out what the meaning is here. So then we'll go from there. What's the meaning of this sentence? Like, what is less than what? So you can explain in the text box. Like, what is less than what? This is really important. Because you have to figure out meaning you know, in order to make sense of these things. So let's figure out meaning. What's less than what? Well, I mean, yeah, so you guys are getting this right in the text box. Um, it's not employment costs are less than they were. So that's what a couple of you guys are typing, and that is not correct. Because that is not what they are talking about. Like if they're saying slightly less than something, that must describe the statistic that we are actually talking about in a sentence. This is something that's really important. You can't just hint at stuff. Like if you do this, you must be talking about the statistic that is actually mentioned in the sentence. Okay, so the problem is that unemployment costs themselves are absolutely not mentioned in the sentence. So we were not talking about the costs themselves. We can't be because we're not saying anything about the costs. So therefore, the meaning is unambiguously that the costs rose by a smaller percent than they did last year. So less than they were doesn't make sense because it, it doesn't, there's nothing to compare this to. So there's two ways to figure out that then they were is, is wrong. Right? There's meaning wise, you, you figure out that the sentence is talking about the percentage by which the cost rose not about the values of the costs themselves. So, that, I mean, that's important. And then also, you can use grammar. If you're talking about helping verbs like this, there's a helping verb did versus helping verb were. Let's talk about that difference. Does anybody know when you can use did or does versus when you can use were in a parallel construction? Go ahead and tell me in the text box if you think you know.
wait a little bit longer on answers to this one. Um, we're getting closer here. Um, what I'll do is actually paste in something I wrote on a forum. So, because this is a little bit complicated. So, if you wait just a second, I'll show you in the next window. So, it'll show up. I'll put an explanation up here in just a second. Okay. So, see next page. Here's how this works. It should show up on your screen in about 10 seconds, maybe 5 seconds. Okay, it's on most of your screens already. So, if you have a form of 2B in the second half of a comparison, then it must be another form of 2B in the first half of the comparison. Okay, 2B has lots of forms, but here's a few of those. Is, are, was, were, have, been, had been, um, etc. So, for example, if you say, if you have this, see the post directly above this one doesn't make sense, so I'll take that out. Um, this is from a forum that I typed in. That's what that's all about. If you say then they were, this would make sense because here's R. This is a form of 2B. This is another form of 2B. They are disappearing. They were disappearing. They are, they were. I am, I was. It is, it was. They were, they had been. So if we take this principle and go back to this problem, let's see if that works. Well, here's the principle. I'll make it a little bit smaller so it fits on the page. These are forms of to be. Were is a form of to be. There's no form of to be over here. Employment costs rose and they were. Nothing parallel to were. In other words, i.e., there's no form of to be over here. So either way, you can eliminate here. The ones that say they were are incorrect for both of those reasons. You can figure it out using meaning because the you're talking about the wrong thing. Like, we're not talking about what the costs were. But you can also figure it out using grammar. If you say less than they were, there has to be another form of to be over here. There isn't one. Smiley face if that makes sense. Okay, now let's talk about they did or it does. So back to here. Um, parking spots disappeared much faster than they did yesterday. Tanya eats more slowly than she did when she was a teenager. So then they did, then she did. That goes with action verbs or general verbs that are not forms of, of to be. So if you have a to do, then you can have an action verb or you could have another form of to do. So that works in this case because rose is an action verb. So they rose less than they rose in the year that it ended in the previous quarter. Like here, she dis they disappeared faster than they disappeared yesterday. Tanya eats more slowly than Tanya ate when she was a teenager. So this comparison works. Rose, 
did stands for rose. That's an action verb. So let's copy that over from this page. Bring it over here. Shrink it so that it fits. And then we're good. Okay. Um, other errors in the other choices. B is incorrect because there's no it. Um, cost is plural. So we can get rid of that. So this doesn't make sense here. This is a pronoun error. And then if you've got lower than, this can't work because this can't describe an action. Like, well, let me describe what lower. Like, the meaning is that we're talking about how much the, the cost rose by. This is a problem because lower can only describe stat static values. Like this can only describe static values. What I mean by that is like constant values. It can't describe actions. In other words, since the sentence is about the rising costs, this doesn't make sense because you can't say the costs rose lower. You have to say they rose less. Like if you were describing the actual level at which they settled, like if you said now they are 4%, which is lower than what it used to be, then that'd be fine. But if you just describe how much they rise, you can't use lower to describe that action. So D is also incorrect. Main deal here is this. The two Bs have to go with other two Bs. If you say they were, you have to have like another is or are, were, has been, or something like that. To do, you can use to stand for an action verb. Um, to wrap up this slide that's over here, if you have a random helping verb, then it should go with the same helping verb, if there's going to be a verb. So, for example, James can negotiate with salespeople more effectively than Stephanie can. That goes with, I can run faster than I could because those are both forms of can. Could is the past tense of can. So if you see this in the second half, you got to have the same helping verb in the first half. It might be in a different tense. Okay, any questions about this problem? Smiling face if you're ready to hit it. Move on to another one. If you have questions, go ahead and type them in the text box, please. Um, for the person asking for the correct answer, we, we've crossed out four of the answers. So, guys, we, we've eliminated four choices. The correct answer is the one that is not eliminated. So, that would be A. All right. Um, let's move on to another problem. Yeah, if we just, you know, bookkeeping. Oh, the boxes and lines are out of place, really? Um, hmm. That's interesting. Does anybody else have the boxes out of place? Okay. Let me take a picture of this and show you what it looks like on my screen. Um, wow. That's weird. Okay, this is what it's supposed to look like on my screen. So I guess I'll let you stare at that for a second. This is what you are supposed to see. Um, I guess I can take pictures of, of this at a later time for the next problem. 
But I certainly hope it's not distorted for everybody else, too. This is what you should see. So again, just a quick recap. Um, the form of 2B is where there's no form of 2B over here. To do did is a form of to do that's parallel to an action verb. There's your action verb. And then the other miscellaneous stuff, we don't really need location for that. So um, weird. I don't know what's wrong with the with the with the screen. Um, I guess for the next problem, I'll take a picture to make sure it doesn't do that. But all good now. All right, it looks fine over here. Smiley face if this makes sense and you guys are ready to move on. Um, and I certainly hope the recording is not crazy like this. So, all right, let's do it. Let's move on to another problem. First, let's do the takeaway sheet on this one. Um, going back to what we learned here. The main takeaway of that one, aside from that helping verb stuff, is you have to think about meaning when you do comparisons. You can't just use grammar. You have to make sure that you are comparing the right things. All right, let's take a look at another problem. Try this one right here. There you go. So let me take a picture of it. Then let me kill it and put the picture on the screen. That way we're all going to look at the same stuff. Okay, here's the problem. It's from GMAT Prep. It's about the second Jawea dollars. Go for it. It's a little bit longer, so I'll give you about a minute and a half. Go for it. Uh, underline, um, the underline is supposed to be here. Okay, um, go ahead and pick an answer if you are one of the last two. Okay, here's the statistics. Um, let's take a look. So, we have two comparisons in this one. This one's a good one. We've got, what's the meaning of the sentence? What's the meaning of this part? The blue highlighted part that's about to be highlighted. Um, go ahead and tell me. What's the meaning of this part? In the text box, tell me what are what are we actually trying to say here? What does that mean? Yeah, but I mean, tell me, a couple of you are giving me vague answers. Like, what, what exactly is substituting for what in what context? Yeah, Gen 1 pretty much has this one. Um, yeah, a couple of you guys are, are actually preserving what is a problem here. Uh, I'll say what I mean. 
So what is substituting for what? Well, let's answer that question first. The Sacagawea question, Sacagawea dollar, I'm going to abbreviate it as SAC. The SAC dollar is substituting for four quarters more than the SAC dollar is substituting for the dollar bill. That's what this is supposed to mean. Because you can figure that out from context because it's substituting for four quarters because it's lighter than four quarters. It's heavier than a dollar bill. So it's not going to substitute for the dollar bill. Um, smiley face if this makes sense. Okay. The problem with B and D is that they do not make that clear. So let me explain why. The problem with B and D is that they are ambiguous. They could have that meaning, but they could also have another meaning. So like B could mean what it's supposed to mean, but it could also mean that the SAC dollar will substitute for four quarters more than the dollar bill will substitute for four quarters. Because we don't know, right? Th this word makes this clear. Like if you say more than for the dollar bill, that's what makes the issue clarified here. If you don't, if you just say more as a substitute for four quarters than the dollar bill, then you 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 don't know. Okay, here's a sentence that's like this, but easier to think about. If you say, I have an easier time talking to Stephanie than Joe, this could mean one of two things. I talk to Stephanie more easily than Joe talks to Stephanie. Or it could mean that I talk to Stephanie more easily than I talk to Joe. This could be either one of these, and B has the same problem. And so does D. Smiley face if you understand why this is an issue here. Like we don't know what the sentence is saying. It could be saying what we want it to say, but it could also be saying something else. So A doesn't have that problem and B doesn't have that problem either. But B and D do. So we can eliminate them. A and E also have the rather than for, so this works here. Now miscellaneous things wrong with, with the other ones. Um, in A, there's a redundancy problem. More rather than you don't use both. So you can't put more with rather than. You have to pick exactly one of these. You either say it's going to be used as a substitute for four quarters rather than for the dollar bill, or more as a substitute for four quarters than for the dollar bill. So, like, more for X than for Y, that's okay. If you say, 
for x rather than for y, that's okay. But both of these is not okay. And then E has the same issue. More rather than that's not okay either. So redundancy issues. Any questions about these? So we've eliminated B and D because of the ambiguity. We've eliminated A and E because they are redundant. That gives us C. So back to our takeaways page here. Other things we've learned about these problems. We learned you have to think about meaning. We've learned you have to think about ambiguity. We should read the sentence carefully to make sure it isn't ambiguous. Okay, if you see little words that are missing from some of the comparisons, there's a really high chance that those are ambiguous. So big, big deal here. So I mean, again, that's your trigger. You can't look for this all the time. But if you see this sort of thing going on here, where the word for is taken out of a couple of these comparisons, you should think really hard to see whether that is ambiguous. Because in a lot of cases, that's why that stupid little helping verb is there. Or in this case, it's a preposition. Sometimes it's a helping verb. So, and then the last thing is watch out for redundancy. So, th th this is a big, big thing. Watch out for redundancy. Don't use two comparison signals. So, if you see something like more with rather than, or if you say increase and more, if you see um, well, it could increase more, so that's a bad example. If I say something like more or less compared to, that's incorrect. If I see more or less or twice as much in comparison to, et cetera, all redundant, and so these are all wrong. So we're about out of time. So instead of giving you complete problems to do, what I want to do is just walk through a few more examples and point these kinds of things out to you without doing the complete problems. So let's just jump through, glance at a couple of problems. This one, we got to take a picture again, otherwise it'll be screwy. So, okay. Here's that problem. I don't want to go through this whole problem, but I'll just give you a quick overview of it. What kinds of things you're looking at here. If you say, unlike the, the other major planets, that's an opening comparison with other planets. So you got to have parallelism. So that means you must be talking about the planet. So Pluto is a planet, that's fine. Pluto is a planet, that's fine. Pluto's orbit is not a planet. Pluto is a planet. The orbit of Pluto is not a planet. So we can eliminate C and we can eliminate E, smiley face, if that makes sense. 
And then notice the missing is in some of these. If you say, look at that, notice the missing is in the orange part. Look for ambiguity. And sure enough, you're going to find it. Without the is, that's ambiguous. Because it could mean Pluto is closer to the sun than to Neptune. Or Pluto is closer Or it could be it could be the sun is farther away from Neptune than Pluto. So we don't know. So that's ambiguous. That's a problem. So bang, bang. Um, a is wrong here because of a comma which. So if you don't know how comma which works, that's described in our sentence correction manual. It's also in class six of our nine session course. So we're not going to discuss that at the moment. But ambiguity is there. Parallelism is there. Any questions about those two things? If not, give me a smiley face. We'll quick glance at a couple more. Okay. Take a look at one more. By the way, one more issue in this problem with Sacagawea that we didn't look at, but is worth looking at. There it is. This is another issue. This thing that's about to show up in orange. The weight is lighter. This is a different form of redundancy, but it's a, it's a redundancy that you've got to learn to look for. We describe that on the takeaway page here. You can't say that a weight is lighter. So don't use two comparison signals, and then also don't use units plus physical description. Let me explain what I mean by that. So let's open this box up to accommodate that. It's inappropriate, for example, to say that a height would be taller. So if you say, like, Joe's height is taller than Jim's, that's wrong. That's redundant. But if you say Joe is taller than Jim, this is OK. And if you say Joe's height is greater, than Jim's height. This is OK. Uh, here's some more examples. If you say the speed is faster, that's wrong. If you say the weight is heavier, that's wrong. If you say the rate is faster, that's wrong. If you say the size is bigger, that's wrong. All of these are wrong. These are all redundant constructions. Smiley face if that makes sense. If you see these things, you can eliminate them immediately. So for instance, it, the speed is faster is wrong. You would either say x is faster than y, or the speed of x is greater than the speed of y. Here, Weight is heavier, wrong. X is heavier than Y, or X's weight is greater than Y's weight, et cetera, et cetera. So if we check out the Sacagawea problem, this is the same issue. The weight is far lighter. 
Let's go ahead and take a look at one more problem. In the 1980s, the rate of increase of the minority population of the United States, we need an underline here too. This starts as the underlines right there. So the rate of increase was twice as fast. So that's a redundancy error. It's incorrect to say that a rate is faster. It's incorrect to say that a rate is fast. You either have to say the rate was greater or twice as much or twice or just say that the population increased faster. So since you can't get rid of the word rate, you have to get rid of fast. Smiley face if that makes sense. So these are incorrect. And then parallelism, you have to actually compare a rate to another rate. So if we have this, the rate of increase was twice as fast as the 1970s. So that's two times greater than the 1970s. That doesn't make sense. You can't compare a decade to a rate. So E is wrong because, because it says that a rate is two times greater than a decade. That's not parallel. Notice here this is fine. Again, in this thing you have this issue of sense of the form of 2B. So here's this. I'll load this onto the screen again. It's a little bit fuzzy, but there's a picture. Thank you for the compliment. We're, we're, but we're done. This is the last problem anyway. So appreciate you saying that. Um, here's your form of 2B. There's a form of 2B. There's another form of 2B. So this is a valid antecedent. And then you're actually talking about two rates. The rate was twice what the rate was in the 70s. Rate, rate. So it's parallel and it's got the 2B going on. So we have a winner. Any questions? We got to get going. We're starting to run way over time here. So um, I'm going to log you guys out in about two minutes. If you have any quick administrative questions, go ahead and dump them in the text box. Um, please do not suggest topics right now. If you have topics to suggest, then please do so in the on the web on the on the front page of Thursday study halls. Any administrative questions you have, I will take them quickly. If not, I will close and log you guys out. The recording is going to stop right